Hello, and welcome to the Recovery Matters podcast from CCAR, the podcast where putting recovery first is always the goal. Here we present interviews, discussions, stories, and speeches to cultivate the understanding and acceptance of the power, hope, and healing of recovery from alcohol and other addictions. Here are your hosts, Phil and Sandy mm-hmm. Valentine. Phil Valentine, I cannot believe you just started the day with that kind of harassment to me. Harassment, look, you texted me a message saying, be careful getting on the highway. They are checking phones for, and, and drivers with phone violations. Yeah, to save you from getting a ticket. Right. Plenty of time when I knew you didn't have your pants on yet. Well, that's a little t- TMI, don't you think? Well. I have my pants on. I was pretty significantly ahead of you on the ride, and I thought, you're always fumbling with getting that phone on the magnet. And so I didn't think you'd be, like, holding it up to your ear, but I'm like, he's totally going to get pulled over. Right. And so you come to the door and you tell me you did. Yeah, because I was reading your text message. (laughs) Right. That is not rigorous honesty. (laughs) So I'm really... It's a prank. I'm very hopeful that I hear more honesty from our guest today. Good morning, Daryl. Good morning. How are you? Good. Daryl's pretty honest. I think so. Yeah. Uh, Yeah. That's part of the deal. Yeah, right? You don't do that to people. Well, that you? was traumatizing for me. I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> for a whole bunch of other reasons, but we're good. <laughs> I think we're doing a, uh, a story slam soon about mistaken identities, and it aligns with what we just talked about, too. I haven't fully hashed it out, but, oh, yeah. You're working on your story. Yeah, I'm working on my story, too. Hmm. It has to be a true story mm-hmm. in the storytelling slams. Mm. Daryl, when did we first meet each other? And would, uh, and introduce yourself to Darryl, the world. Yeah, yeah. oh man, go. thank you. I'm an <laughs> honor and a privilege to be here. Daryl McGraw, mm-hmm. um, person in long-term recovery, I would say. Like, you know, May 7, 2007. Like, what, yes. a, what a gift. Congrats. And for me, yeah, that's, that's a big deal. That's the last time I used the substances, last time I... Put a drink in my body, and the last time I've been in the back of a police car, which is all significant to my story and journey. And, you know, so, you know, I don't know, man. I'm just super excited, you know, where mm-hmm. this journey of recovery has taken me. And, you know, mm-hmm. and I got to meet Phil. And it was so weird. Um, it usually is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Meeting Phil. <laughs> I don't know. It was um, I was going for this job, and I needed a... Um, well, she didn't even like me when she first met me. She uh, couldn't stand me. That wasn't my experience. I was like, <laughs> I want to do that. I want to do what he does. I want to be like that. I like, you mm-hmm. know, because he was leading the, um, the recovery coach training. Mm-hmm. And I needed it for this job I was going for. And um, so I got to see him in art. And I think it was your one of your last, like, you were like, this is going to be my last coaching because you were going to go do some other stuff, or I don't know if you had no, just come back. I think I was going on the Appalachian yeah. Trail, maybe. Were you going on the trail then? Yeah. Yeah, yeah that's mm-hmm. how long ago it was. So, and I just was, like, fascinated by the whole, you know, like, just what we learned in a recovery coaching class, you know, already being a person in recovery, but learning how to apply those tools mm-hmm. to that. So, and I've been in a million trainings, but that one was very significant to me. So then I got to meet Phil, and... I, I feel like we've been friends ever since, you know, and, and a mentor to me, too, because many of times in, as I've journeyed up and down the career path, um, I've consulted with Phil yeah. on numerous things, and and he's always been, to my knowledge, honest about his, his mm-hmm. opinion has been very <laughs> honest in, in that respect, right? Mm-hmm. So I think that, you know, so I, I admire the relationship. Well, I have to be t- honest with Daryl because he's taller and bigger and stronger and younger than me. So I can see I, I, that. I, 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 <laughs> he smells better, too. Wow. I shower sometimes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he fills into this pine scent oh. because he likes the scent of pine. I know, it's the forest, right? Yeah. It's the forest. Yeah. yeah. Someone tried to get me to go glamping, and I was like, oh, that sounds cool. What is, oh, no, no, I'm not. No, no. <laughs> that is not. No, glamping no. is not enough. For Camping's you. not your thing, then. Not either. my thing either. No, so you no. wouldn't hike through the woods with uh, everything on I'd your back. I'd hike up and... to the tenth floor of the Hilton, and, <laughs> you know, there you get go. one of those robes and well, forest is, down it, to the breakfast bar. There is yeah. the irony because before 2015, Phil considered a motel without room service camping. So uh, he has had a metamorphosis. Uh, I have at a late stage. And how how happy I can be with very little. 
Yes, yes. You know, which is interesting to me. Mm-hmm. See, he says stuff like that. Like, like, right? That's significant. Like, that, like, you know, I said something to someone, like, I've been poor all my life, right? So I've been at, afforded some really great opportunities, but I've had nothing. Mm-hmm. So I'm always like, yeah, yeah, like, mm-hmm. excited to be in the moment because if – the worst case scenario, we lose it all. Okay, so I've also been incarcerated and I've also been in substances. My only prayer to God was that I stay drug free and I stay out of prison. Everything else, I'm, I'm ready. Let's mm-hmm. go. Now I pray for good health. <laughs> I, I need that in an audio clip. <laughs> well, we, we could have it. For myself. Like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Replay. But we talk, you talked a little bit about your ups and downs in your career. And yeah. the last time we talked you've had some realizations too that what we perceive as a down or a Absolutely. ending yeah. is almost like a new beginning yeah. of something even better yeah i know sandy can relate to that as well yeah yeah just my second act was after a 33 year corporate life right oh, yeah. i yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. fell apart and then i have had an incredible few years working in collegiate recovery so wow and being around the CCAR community and being able to interview folks and hear their incredible stories. So I'm super eager to hear yours. Yeah, and before we get to yeah. your, like, beginning and early, what is it you do now? And I don't know. People, that? people ask me that all the time, and I I'm just know. like, man, I don't know. I just wake up. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, I just wake up, and, I, you know, I, I do some consulting, so I started my own organization after working for Demas. I was a director at Demas for a while, um, for about three and a half years which where I got to work with Phil professionally, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and then I started doing some after they told me that it was my last day, right? Which we can get into that, right? <laughs> when they told me it was my last day, and I was like, you know, um, wow, what am I going to do in my life, right? And so I started an organization called Formerly Inc. because the phone never stopped ringing. Mm-hmm. Even though I wasn't in that role anymore, people were still asking me to come and speak. And they wanted to hear me and wanted to hear my views or would interview mm-hmm. me. And, and I was like, wow. And, you know, and then they were like, hey, like it really kind of started like somebody called me and said, hey, could you come? We'd like you to speak at this thing. And how much do you charge? <laughs> and I was like, how much do I charge? <laughs> <laughs> and I remember saying like $50 an hour because I never made $50 an hour. And they were like, okay. And they jumped on it so quickly. I was like, maybe that's too low. <laughs> yeah, you start <laughs> right? at 150 and go up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got the 150 pretty quick, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I started doing that. So Formally Inc., I started working with Formally Inc., and then I was fortunate to meet like Andrew Clark and different people that are that were really talking about reentry and how reentry is. I started out, let me just say, I started out in recovery. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and then I started talking more about reentry. And getting out of prison with all these gaps in the system. Mm. And so I started to pursue, like, okay, so I'm a recovery guy, but there's so many holes in reentry. And then I started to see that there, like, all this stuff is really, at the end of the day, all related to human rights mm-hmm. and social justice mm-hmm. and all these different things. So I mm-hmm. met, like, Andrew Clark and CCSU, and we started, I started, and I'll just stop me whenever, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Um, I went to Building Bridges, and I remember sitting in the audience, and I said, man, one day I'm going to be on that stage. The next year I was on the stage with, like, you know, um, with Wally Lamb, like being interviewed by Wally Lamb. Wow. So I was like, wow, this is cool. That and is I was cool. Like, the next, you know, and then the next year I was representing Demas in Yale, right? And I was, like, facilitating a conversation. I was like, wow, this mm. this is cool. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And then the next year, I was actually the a keynote. Mm-hmm. So just watching from one seat to another to another, and that's kind of been my journey all the way across the board. I went from, you know, literally getting out of prison, working as a, um, I started out as a peer support staff person, which I did re, I did <laughs> um, the recovery specialist training and it's like, mm-hmm. I took I took them all. Every all right, training there was, man. I took them all. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I was a recovery support staff person, and I also um, did the recovery coaching training, and and just started moving, you know, on the chessboard of life, right? And man, what a gift! So I've been afforded some really great opportunities, but along the way, you know, I always talk about pebbles and boulders, which Phil can relate to on the mm-hmm. trail, right? Mm-hmm. The boulders are the things that you can see. It's the pebbles that you that trip us up, like right. 
I didn't see a lot of things and I didn't know how to play the game per se. And um, I ended up finding myself like slipping on these different pebbles, Mm -hmm. which thankfully it was just more like, just like life showing you in a way. But for me and for those of us that are in recovery, as long as we don't use and we stay on the path, it it could get bad, but nothing was worse than um, being addicted to crack okay. I think to, when you talk about pebbles and boulders, I thought you were gonna use like filling your life, your glass jar as your life. Mm-hmm. And the pebbles are the things that, the boulders are the things that are most important. So you put those in first. And then you put in pebbles so it'll fill around the boulders right. and then the sand. But if you do it the other way, there's no room for sand the boulders. Sand first, pebbles, there's no room for the So <laughs> it's anyway, ironic that you say that, <laughs> yeah. no, because I was in a leadership training, right? And one of my men- my current mentors right now, I find them along the journey, right? Mm-hmm. Gave me this video with, mm-hmm. the, with showing me like, hey, you're doing things and it's really great. But I just want you to see this video, and I'm watching it, and it's these rocks, and, <laughs> and I'm like, I don't get it. Why? Why? And then it made so much sense. So mm-hmm. you refer to that, and he's like, Oh, here's this rock thing. It's I, I had so much to tell you guys. So it's just, right. like, yeah, yeah, it's so cool. How things like show up in life, mm-hmm. and then they reappear, and you kind of like, you know, like just so many things that I was like, Man, God, why, why, why? I don't. I can't believe I was like doing so good and then he was like yeah that was nothing I got something else to show you yeah Mm -hmm. I think often about almost like you know pushing one of those doors that comes back right like God like pushes the door I push the door away from what he wants me to learn but it comes back and I keep pushing it off and then sooner or later the door is locked and you're knocking your head against it so Mm -hmm. I didn't think of it like that Yeah, yeah that's cool how um Where'd you grow up? Where were you born? Yeah, I'm so I'm from Stanford, the West Side. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So shout out to all my people from the West Side, Stanford. Who did we have there? Mindy, right? Mag Mindy's from the West Side. Maggie Young's from the West Side. Oh, oh there's, there's really? A million. Yeah, Maggie. If those that you know, Maggie, that's yeah. like my mentor. Mindy's my girl too. Um, wow. Who else? Um, there's other people I don't want to mm-hmm. out yeah, them, but right. Keith. I'll just say Keith is from the, is from the West Side. Yeah. Um, all those like people that I got to watch or hug at C Car mm-hmm. have come. We all find our way. Yeah. And yeah, so yeah, I'm um, from the West Side of Stanford. I grew up, born and raised there, and um, yeah, that's where I, that was my that was my first university, West Side University. I learned a lot <laughs> in the street. I tell everybody, mm-hmm. I learned about girls, money, everything in the street. Like mm-hmm. you know, um, yeah. What was family life like for you? Have siblings, parents? Yeah, so my dad left when I was six. What do you mean left? Oh yeah, he just yeah. This guy was like, um, so when I was six years old, we were moving, and my dad, um, my dad came to my like we were we were moving. I was super excited, and because um, we lived in a one bedroom apartment, and that's a story in itself. Living with your parents in a one bedroom apartment, you see way more than you need to see at a young age, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so when we were moving into an apartment building, my dad came and he said, um, you know, we're moving, but I'm not coming with you, right? So that was really my first experience with trauma, right? So him saying he's not coming with, with us, and he and he also said that um, hmm. you're the man of the house hmm. at six at years at old. six? Yeah, so I had to think about all the things that he did, and I really was confused. But my life really changed at six years old when he said I was the man in the house, and I really took on those responsibilities I had different relationships with my mom, right? Mm-hmm. Adult conversations. I was responsible for um, taking care of my brother, making sure he got to the sitter, um, and just you know, latchkey kid like many people, coming home at at six years old, unlocking the doors, locking the doors, making sure that you know I, I locked the door. I would be in in first grade wondering if I turned the gas off or not. Um, just a lot of responsibilities had changed. And I think that even though my dad thought telling me I was the man of the house was, like, 
I don't know. I don't really know what he thought. Or encouraging, maybe. maybe it even. was probably my yeah. son is eighteen and he can't figure out how to get the trash <laughs> from the back of the house to the front of the house. I'm like, yo, there's this, hey, we have sons like yeah. that too. I'm like, there's a <laughs> truck right that comes and picks the trash up, and then once you put it, like they take it, yeah. you have to bring it back. Yeah. It's not gonna make itself back. <laughs> so, um, yeah, he has. A, so I would never tell this guy that he was the man of the house. <laughs> just, just saying, right. So yeah, my mom was a single mom. Shout out to the single moms out there that mm-hmm. you know that are doing it. Um, you know, I'm a product of a single mom, and yeah, it was it was different. So that was that journey. So hanging in the street, and um, in our environment was a lot of violence. So witnessing violence, and then eventually becoming a perpetrator of violence, right? Because a lot of the um, people would say, like the older people, right? The matriarchs in our neighborhood would be like, if he keeps messing with you, hit him in the head with something, right? I know today that's an assault second, so <laughs> it probably wasn't the best advice, but they were trying to like say, people will leave you alone, and, and everything was you know um, solved with violence, and so witnessing that, and that it was like the, only the strong survive, and that's how through that trajectory I found myself at 19 in prison. Did you, did your, when you say your dad walked out, did you like lose all contact with him? You didn't want any. No, he was, he was, he he turned into a dollar dad, right? And I said dollar, I didn't say hundred dollar dad, I said (laughs) dollar dad, right? So he threw dollars at everything, right? So I'd be like, I have a problem. He's like, here's five bucks. Or, you know, so we got to see him on the weekends, we got to see him. And he became more of a friend than a dad, Mm -hmm. right? So um, as I went through my teenage years and learned how to sell drugs and stuff, I would go to him and I smoked weed with him and he just was more of a friend than a dad, right? So I think that um, he stuck around for a while. He passed away in 1993 of throat cancer. Yeah, but we didn't have, yeah, and he never had the opportunity to see me on this side of the fence. Right. He always saw me in the street, in and out of jail. He never saw me um, as a person in recovery and, and accomplishing the things that I have. So in your teenage years, were you going to school? Yeah, I went to school. I, I breezed through there every once in a while. Um, yeah, I went to West Hill. They called it West Hill, but you know, <laughs> I went to West Hill, and I was a senior. You know, I you know we started selling drugs, crack era. You know, the crack epidemic happened, and that was a game changer. Well, who was your crowd? Did you play sports? Were you studious? Or were you nah, just I was going? in the in crowd. I think I was in the in crowd. I was cool. Like I, was, I wanted to be cool, and you know what? What? The, so define cool back in those well, days. Well, let me just say, that. I know yeah. this is an obvious question, but you are tall in stature. <laughs> There's no basketball in your life? So let me tell you. When I went to school, um, I got, to, like, freshman year, I walked into the school, and this white coach was like, you're on my team. He was like yelling it like first day, like you're on my team and that's it. And you know, now I emphasize the fact that he was white because I'm coming from the hood. I don't know this dude. He's like mm-hmm. an older white guy yeah. yelling at me, you're on my team and that's it. And I was like, so I did everything not to be on his team. I was like, no, I'm not. That was, that was control. Aww. We talk about power, but if you understand where I come from, right? My dad left at six years old. So no man has told me what to do in mm decades right Right. so I get to high school and this guy all of a sudden is yelling at me I haven't had nobody um, a male yell at me in an authoritative manner in a long time so I didn't I rejected it instead of respecting it and you know now what I know like you know having been there for my son who is an avid basketball player and I look at a lot of people that I grew up with that were in sports Mm -hmm. their values and their you know their movements were different Mm -hmm. not that they didn't end up in the same place as some, but a lot of their, like that team spirit and yeah, all we that. Yeah, we had people talk about the concept of team and how important that was. Yeah. And sometimes it was the only thing that held them together for a period of time. Yeah. But I think of art when you say, you know, uh, he always tells a story in the white privilege piece about being in a store and a woman tapping him on the shoulder. You're tall. You must have played basketball. Can you reach that item we for me? <laughs> I know, right? We hate it's that. So, it's so stereotypical, isn't That's it? That's why I prefaced it, but I had to ask. Uh, no, no, a lot of people think that. And, you know, I didn't play, and I, maybe yeah. I should have, but... Wow. You seem but, pretty coordinated. You're pretty athletic, aren't you? Yeah, I, I know how to get the ball, you know. There. <laughs> you but at the time, so freshman year, 
crack came out in 10th grade, 9th, 10th grade. By the time 10th, 11th grade, I was making a, probably like on a low estimate of $4,000 a week. <laughs> you know, I mean, a, a day. I said a week, but a day. On certain days, we were making so much money that it was like we thought this was like it forever. And you come, were. Yeah. In yeah. high school. In high school. My, what did my, you do with all that money? We just spent it as fast as it came. <laughs> One teacher brought me into the uh, office, and he says, how am I going to teach this guy when he has my month's salary in his pocket? Mm-hmm. And I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what we doing? How are you going to teach What are we doing here? <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. you know? And uh, I remember um, he's probably the biz- top business or something. Now. Yeah, he was. Yeah, he, was he, he was. He was. He was interesting because later on he says, "I should. I would love to tell you, teach you how to invest that money." And I was like thinking he just wanted to take our money, but I wish I. I wish I listened to him then. Um, yeah. And I remember in a, like eleventh or twelfth grade, um, we were like we were doing crazy stuff, ordering pizza. So when you say and, we, who's we? Like just my my crew, like or the people that I hung with, or some of who. Describe some of your crew. So I grew up in the friend. So okay, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So I grew up in the I grew crew. up in the friendship building, right in the West Side. So shout out to uh-huh. all my people um, that uh-huh. grew up there, and we were different. We were kind of like the preppies of the hood. Like we wore polo. Right? Oh, and you were and, always and, you were yeah. always sharp dressed. Yeah. yeah. So we were different than the other guys, and um, the other projects or neighborhoods. So we spoke differently. We, which is a benefit. Right, we we really like we we spoke differently. We so people knew just by the way we were either dressed or spoke. Right, and a lot of times we were um, stigmatized as we spoke quote unquote white because we spoke proper. Mm-hmm. Which you know now we know that <laughs> white people don't own proper speech. It's just read a little bit. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> go to some stay in class a little longer. You might you might talk like that. Yeah, <laughs> um, but. You know, having that experience, and, um, growing up with those friends, so we just our our movements were different, and we you know we would order pizza to the to the cafeteria, <laughs> like like pizza was a big thing in high school, like pizza parties, mm-hmm. but we would have them randomly, like and mm-hmm. we were just we just had like expendable money and not really any direction. Yeah. So I want I want you to like do a like describe one or two people. The, the actual people you hung out with. Oh man, there were so many. I, mean, I know, man. but how did were you the leader of all this? Would you say? I think that you become the leader without wanting to be. I well, think that I was. You have natural yeah. leadership qualities. Because you're right? the man of the house, now right? you're the man of your the business cafeteria. Enterprise. Yeah, leaders are <laughs> leaders are chosen. So were you? Right? Or, or you yeah, you, I, made, I, you yeah, ran it. You absolutely, were the, you were in charge. In my in my, there were others that came before me that were in charge that I looked up to, but I think for my generation yeah. and my crew, I was definitely the leader um, in in the respect of people really listened to me, and it wasn't about, like, strength or brute force. Like, I like to associate myself with the lion. The lion is not the strongest animal in the jungle. He's not the biggest. It's not, but the way the lion carries himself mm. or herself, mm-hmm. right, the lioness, mm. It just moves. It moves mm-hmm. different. So I think that that's what it was. I had that lion mentality earlier, before I knew. Like right. So I, it wasn't. I gotta about, tell you a story about the lion. I love the lion. Well, Don't tell me anything bad about the lion. Oh <laughs> no, 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 no! I no. love the lion. So our daughter's in Kenya, and we went on safari and saw lions in the wild. Oh man! And the, the way they carry themselves. I mean, there's a there's a fleet of trucks. And they just walk right Safari through. Truck. Yeah. Safari. They don't. Yeah. They're not. They're That's not worried the about lion. nothing. They just <laughs> swagger right through. And they just sit down on a, a perch and just look around. And and our son was so impressed with the lion that his first year away at Chicago at university, he came home with a giant uh, on his An entire tattoo on, sized. A tattoo on his yeah. on his thigh. You know, I have lines everywhere. Like in my Good house. For you. That's cool. In my house I have this like enormous no one likes it but me. <laughs> enormous gold lion that if you're like if we're zooming, you could see it and people are like What's up with the lion? I'm like, I like it. Like, I literally oh, yeah. had my son carrying it through New York streets when I saw it. They were like, you're going to buy that? I'm like, yep. Were you born in August, by any chance? No. no. Are you uh, sad okay. about I'm that? I'm an Aries. Uh-huh. Okay. Yeah. 
Yeah, Soda Lion, and I, I think that you did know. You ever have a? Should... Did you have a street name? Or yeah. Just... So, ah oh, man, Phil, you're taking, you're asking the hard ones, right? <laughs> well, I'm so, supposed to. That's what we do. So my street name is weird um, because when I was younger, I guess I was a happy baby. So some lady named me Chipper, right? Chipper, happy, right? Mm-hmm. And um. <laughs> So we grew up with these, like, we, we used to go, I got a, an interesting story if we can fit it in there somewhere. Please. Um, so we used to go to this lady. All right, I got to tell you, right? right yeah. I'm going to tell you. We're all family, right? I'm going to yeah. tell you this one, right? So we used to go, when we were younger, my mom used to take us to this babysitter, and her name was Mama Lawson. And Mama Lawson had one rule. You had to pray before you get your food, right? Mm-hmm. So my mom would pick us up from school and she would buy us McDonald's and you could smell it in the car you couldn't eat a fry you couldn't do anything because you had to wait till you got to Mama Lawson's house so like we're literally like oh my god I can't wait to have this cheeseburger and <laughs> when we would get to Mama Lawson's house um, she'd be like alright you know what it, you know the rules right mm-hmm. so she made you go and, and wash your hands and then she would you would sit at the table, and she would bring that cheeseburger and fries, and she would spread the paper out, and she'd pour the fries on the paper, and she would cut the cheeseburger. And to this day, that is the best cheeseburger I ever had. But you had to pray before you ate it. Mm-hmm. So we um, we grew up with um, these other guys were there, too, like a lot of people, my friend Scott and, um, and Beaver. <laughs> um, they were our friends. Chipper mm-hmm. and Beaver. Yeah. yeah. So they were there at Mama Lawson's house. So when my mom moved into the projects, Scott and Beaver were there, and they knew my name was Chipper. So all the kids thought that was hilarious. Like, oh, oh Chipper, Chipper, right? And I kind of wasn't sure, but it just took off. People just uh, kept calling me it. And as I got older, it got cut to Chip. Mm-hmm. And then chip off the old block and chip, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So chip kind of stuck. Mm-hmm. I added, as you know, growing up, I added, tried to be all these different chili C and all these different people, but <laughs> it always stuck as chip, right? Wow. And um, so that was my street name by by default, you know. And then when I went to other towns and other places, I changed my name for for reasons, right? <laughs> <laughs> right. So I changed my name, but. To this day, when I when I go and I show up in different cities, if a person calls me Chip, I know that they know me from way back. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like they know me from way back. Versus if a person says, "Hey, that's Mike," then they might know me from. <laughs> <laughs> and we were like, "No, that's not Mike. That's Chip. He's from Stanford." And they're like, "No, that's Mike. He's from New London." <laughs> so what is your name? <laughs> yeah, is it Daryl? I don't remember. Like, no, is it Daryl? <laughs> yeah, I stopped. No, you know what? It's funny because, like, Chip is my name, and I, I'm a, it, it is definitely an endearing name that I, I um, you know, I definitely love. Mm-hmm. But I also don't like what it stood for, right. like, in certain respects. So mm-hmm. the people that call me it, I know that they either they grew up with me in a rough mm-hmm. period of time, yeah. And I own that. Like I, I let I, I don't like certain people get to a certain age and like don't call me that anymore, or they've <laughs> moved on from that. I uh-huh. don't. I, I, I embrace that because the people that call me that, like, it's every once in a while, I'll get somebody that heard that was that was my name, mm-hmm. and they were like, oh, I want to call you. I'm like, yeah, that's not. Yeah, it, it, it's symbolic to certain people that I grew up with. Um, What's your mom call you? Oh, my mom's always called me Daryl. Oh, okay, good. And 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 it, it's funny you say that because in when I was young and dating, mm-hmm. no girls ever called me Chip. Oh, no. they always wanted. They always thought it was even though everybody called me Chip. Mm-hmm. Girls always wanted like, can I call you Daryl? I want to call you what your mom calls you. I'm like, all right. So it's weird that like we would be in the street and all these people would be like. Chip, and then my girlfriend would come up and be like, Daryl, I need to speak to you. And they'd be like, Daryl, well, like, <laughs> I'm like, but that's my name. Like, yeah. So, um, and my son's name now. So, you Aww. know, um, which, you know. Your um, son's name Chip? His name is Daryl now. <laughs> yeah, he can, he can never be a, he can never be a Chip. Which is good. Uh, yeah. Which is a huge, huge thing. You know, I, I remember we have some moments, and I, I said to my son one day, we're coming from the Million Man, the 25th anniversary 
of the Million Man March. And he yeah. was in the car and he was like sleeping, right? And I look at him and I was like, bro. He was like, what's up, dad? I'm like, you never got to be a street dude. Mm -hmm. yeah. And he was like, I was like, you'll never have to know what it's like to be in a cell. You never have to know. Like, I got a lot of scars on my face, never been in a car accident. They've all come from the street and battles in the street and the trauma that comes with that. So I said, you never, like one of my, like we know as parents, some of our greatest accomplishments have nothing to do with the accolades that the world gives us. It's the people that we produce, mm. right, that we create. So I'm, I'm proud that this guy is 18. My first, in 19 years old, I, I was in prison, G Block, death row, down the hall from death row. This guy is in New Jersey, headed to college, and gonna, you know, wants to go to law enforcement. I don't know why, but whatever. Mm -hmm. Would support that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and, you know, and my daughters are like, you know, I have three kids, two daughters and a, and a, and a son, and their experiences are a lot different than mine, right? Mm -hmm. You know, their biggest problem is that the internet is not working. Mm -hmm. You know, I told them I was gonna give them a test <laughs> And I was going to bring out one of the old school ice trays mm -hmm. and put it in see front of them and see if who could get the ice out. Uh, yeah, because that's that. they they don't you know and I and they don't get it like you know that that's our reality. That's I come from the ice tray and God help you if you didn't put water back in the ice tray. Oh yeah, right. right. But um, so I'm proud to say that I've been able to to give them that experience. Mm -hmm. So I grew up in Windsor, which is north of Hartford, but pretty suburban. So mm -hmm. everything I know about the street is from movies, right? Yeah, yeah. And from what I've learned from interviews we've done. Yeah. But so is this a business enterprise for you in high school or are you part of a gang? Like what, what's yeah, the personalities so of that? The gangs weren't really popular when I grew up. It was like you're from the west side, so you were from that conglomerate if you mm -hmm. will then I was from friendship building so I was from that like right so if it was an office if mm -hmm. it, so the west side would be the corporation yeah and then friendship building would be the mail the mail room or you know <laughs> gotcha. right yeah. so we we represented that and we operated like that but it really wasn't it just was like how you grew up and where you were from um so my experiences were, you know, like that. And, you know, it's interesting that my mom and people would say, stay away from the West Side. Don't go to the West Side. So as kids, the first place we would go when we got old enough was to the West Side. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we saw a lot that probably we shouldn't have saw. But I think that, you know, I don't regret growing up there. I did learn a lot of stuff. I learned a lot of stuff about life that has propelled me into corporate life. And I always say that the difference between working at the state or in corporations and the street is you, in the street, you know who you're beefing with. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, you, that's deep. There's a lot of quotes Yeah, today. Yeah, that's You yeah. know who you're beefing with. And those yeah. of us that, you know, and those of us that are in peer roles and peer leadership, right? I'll give you another one, right? This is free, you guy. You <laughs> have this one, right? Um, <laughs> is that the systems hire us and fire us for the same reasons mm -hmm. yeah you know and, and you and i've had that kind of yeah. situation, right? all the peer leaders i know they're like oh my god you're great you're great and then oh my god you gotta go you're like for the same reasons for the same relationships for the same things for us just being human and providing spaces for humans and you know i think that you, you know cross a boundary because you care yeah. And you've broken a policy that right. prevented you from doing the right thing. Right. And so, you know, at CCAR, I refused to create a policy that would prevent our coaches from doing the right thing. Exactly. Right. And, and, yeah, it's it's interesting. Like, even for me, like, you know, I was, I thought being at, in the state at Demas, Cherrywood Furniture, my own office, mm -hmm. street dude, I had arrived. Yeah. I thought that was, whoo, like, mm -hmm. man, I'm good. And in that system, I could have done nothing mm -hmm. and been there for 20 years. Right. The other thing I will say, and not to bash these systems because that's not what I'm about, but I do get to say what I want now, so mm -hmm. I'm cool. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. um, is that in prison, you run into people and they're like, I got 10 years left. I got five years left. I got this left. 
in the state systems and in these systems. It's the same thing. It's the same thing. Oh my god! You're like you walk into someone's office and you're like, I got five years left. I'm like, I'm like, how's it going today? I got five years left. I'm like, yo, this is crazy. It's creepy here. Like, what do you mean? Like, I'm excited. I'm like, we're gonna change the world. I never heard you say that before. (laughs) That is amazing. It's It's so true. Right. I have. Um, wow. I work with a, a young person, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. she she would flourish in a different environment. Yeah. But she's already tied into the retirement plan, mm-hmm. like in her brain, like under thirty, right? Yeah. Already tied in. I'm oh, like, no. it's disgusting, darling, because that was me. Yeah. <laughs> like you're way too young to not feel like you're doing meaningful yeah. work, and that oh my God, you know yeah. you're valued. Yeah, and so it's hard to get things accomplished Mm -hmm. in those rooms because everybody's worried about that five or ten years. Mm -hmm. They're not, they're not, like when you're talking about meaningful change, you're talking about making a difference. Mm -hmm. They're talking about, oh, 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 we can't do that. I'm like, huh? Like, so, you know, um, you know, I'm I'm glad that God has blessed me Mm -hmm. with, um, a moral compass, if mm-hmm. you will, mm-hmm. that like, yeah, money, yeah, man, I struggle, bills, sometimes don't know when the lights, if the lights are gonna be on tomorrow, but mm-hmm. consciously, I'm good, mm-hmm. right? And, and always, as we know, it always comes like, when you think it's that, when you think that bottom's gonna fall out, mm-hmm. it, it always, always comes through. It's, we just had this lengthy conversation last weekend about all this because one of the blessings of recovery that I have not achieved after 30 years yeah. is the the loss of the fear of financial insecurity. Uh, I still have that all the time. But I left a corporate job, and I make a third of what I made. Mm-hmm. And somehow we still have the house. We still have cars. Mm. I still bought a new pair of boots last week. We can still FYI. watch Netflix. Yeah. So That's all right. I bought a fishing reel. So my thing was <laughs> when I got to we just drop those. In. <laughs> this is us was having good, our was conversations. Was, was, right by the way, I bought a you know I bought a I bought a, I bought a, I bought a oh, Rolls yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> if you see something in the driveway, <laughs> right? um, yeah, I think that you know for me like it, it's the same thing, right? Mm-hmm. It's like you know it. We're just grateful to be in recovery, so everything else is gravy. And um, I think, like, for me that, you know, I, I'll just say this, too. I remember going in, in, in grad school, a professor said to me, and this, is, this, is, this was interesting, that he said that as a black man, people will tell you $50,000 is a lot of money, and, and you should be satisfied with that because not a lot of black men make $50,000 a year. And I was like, oh, that's that, Okay. And then I was in. I've been in certain rooms, and they've said that. Mm-hmm. And I'm like, like argue like I was like, hey, everybody here on this team makes a hundred thousand dollars a year. And they said, I know. I was like, I'm the only person that doesn't make six figures. They were like, I know. Not like we're gonna fix that. They were like, I know. So. That came. That was that came to fruition, and I even had people say, "Well, why do you think you're worth fifty thousand? I'm like, "Yeah, I think I'm worth a hundred million, but whatever, right?" <laughs> and um, so those structures, right, that we talk about, these systems, mm-hmm. also control how much people make, right? Mm-hmm. So when I was at Demons and when I was at the State, rather, I thought that you know. Um, I had made this, and actually, just to be clear, so we don't have people coming back saying, well, you never really worked for Demons. I actually worked for Yale, contracted by Demons, so we're clear, right, in the, yeah. in the conversation. But I thought I was making I was making way more money than I ever made in my life. But then they told me that that was over. So someone had that control. It's just like, I, you know, owning your own property, no one can evict me, right? I guess the government or my mortgage company at some point could, right? right? Mm-hmm. But no one could tell me that it's my last day. And um, the interesting thing is that um, I thought that, I, like, I literally thought that I had arrived, like I said, and now I make more money than, you know, I've ever made in my life and way more money than I made in that role. So when we go back to, like, well, for me. Well, I also say that that just the way you speak, and I've heard you speak many times, and um, you're also an entrepreneur. 
you're a natural businessman. I mean, when you talk about being in high school, right. making four thousand dollars a day, that's crazy. It was I mean, people, people go what? Yeah, my mom didn't make that, and but my mom, my mom, yeah. who do, who makes four thousand dollars a day? My mom, <laughs> I, mean, I, I tell you, like I always say, money. I always say, my mom, my mom didn't want anything to do with that. She didn't care how much money. I was like, mom, I'm so, gonna buy you a house. Did she know what you were doing? In some in respect, and at yeah. a certain point, she made me. You know, she was like, I left my house when I was about sixteen or seventeen. I moved in with a girl, and you know, and haven't been back since. And um, so, and so, let's. Uh, because I think I do want to set the stage for some of the key issues you yeah. talk about with yeah. with uh, system, um, I don't know what you call reformation or transformation that are possible or whatever, and why you're such a powerful influence in the recovery uh, field and the reentry field now. But how did you end up in prison back in 19 yeah. and, and kind of go yeah. through that experience? Because cool. I know you, you share that a yeah, lot. Yeah. And, your insights are amazing about all that. Yeah, I think it's crazy. Like, you know, I spent 10 years of my life in and out of the Department of Corrections on what I call the installment plan, right? <laughs> so I go in for a few years, come back out, make sure the food is still gross, right? And, <laughs> and so I cycled through that system for about 10 years of my life. The initial time, it was all drug-related, though. Every bit of it was drug-related. And when I look at the common denominator, every time I ended up in prison, it was due to substances, whether I was going to get them, sell them, use them. Somehow, drugs was the common, uh, um, the common de- denominator for me. So, right? talk to me about how you were in prison. Were, yeah. were, were you chip? Were you a leader? Were you a battler? Mm-hmm. Were you a quiet? What'd you no, do? Man, that's crazy that you say that, Phil. Like, um, yeah. So I was institutionalized, right? And. The crazy part about that, I appreciate the question, uh-huh. is because in the street I was chip. I was down for whatever. Like, yeah, you, you were know, a battler. Guns, you were whatever. Yeah, like yeah. yeah. The second I entered prison, I became this Daryl McGraw, straight up, no like follow the rules type of guy. No Which, kidding. Yeah, it was institutionalized behavior, and I didn't realize it till like a couple of stints, right? I kept going. Well, it's through. called the Department of Correction. Did they correct you? No, 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 no. <laughs> I corrected myself because wow. it was a, it was a what institutionalization is meaning that I needed a structured environment in order to function, and many of us do, right? right? Many of us go into treatment, and we program well. Yeah. Right? We're good programmers, right? Yeah. When we're in treatment, we're opening the door and, good morning, good morning, how are you? Would you like some coffee? <laughs> but yet, and you're in the street and you're like, F you, whatever, you know what I mean? You know, good morning, man, right? So there's this transformation that happens consistently when we get in structured environments, and that's what was going on for me. So I cycled in and out of prison. So, so would you say, though, you talked about the installment plan, yeah. you do a bid, and you know. you're institutionalized, and then did you re- revert right back to the right street? Back. So you're like two people almost. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? I, <laughs> I, I like that you say that because you're two people, and I could be chip in the street, and I could have just smacked somebody in the head with a bat. Yeah. Right? Not that I'm proud of, but <laughs> yeah. happened. Right? But then go in the house, and my mom would be like, Daryl, take the garbage out. So here's like, these worlds that you're battling like, okay. with, right? <laughs> like you're in the street and you have to have this persona, right? Right, And then you're at home, or even so, like even when I became a parent and still was in the street, I would be a dad at home and nobody would care about my street rep there. All right. But then I would come in, like, you know, I would go out in the street and I would call shots or I would be a shot caller. Right, so that's a different, so two different worlds that you struggled living in. Which for a long time, that was me. I had I had to live in two different worlds. So I'm having a massive epiphany. Let's go today. (laughs) Let's go. I don't know if it's accurate or not, but you like at the beginning of our conversation, you mentioned like you know the physical violence and the trauma associated with it, and all of a sudden, like I am listening to you and looking at you. And realizing that even though you're doing it under the influence, that being hit or whatever you're experiencing physically is traumatic, even though you might not know it at the time, and hurting somebody else physically 
is traumatically. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. so when we look at people committing these acts of violence, I have not looked at it in terms of the trauma that they're mm -hmm. storing yeah. up somewhere in them because even though they did it, it is not their human nature. No, no, no. We talk about that too. Um, so shameless plug, right? Mm -hmm. Urban Trauma, December 5th. Um, me mm -hmm. doing a TED Talk, Hartford, it'll come through. Uh, are you? Yeah, a yeah, TED yeah. Talk. Yeah, Congratulations. Yeah. So we'll That's see. big we'll news. We'll see. Hopefully, yeah, yeah. So drop mm -hmm. it here, right? Mm -hmm. um, but when I work with, so I've been working with brothers in prison for about four years in a, in a group called The Way Out, which mm -hmm. internally is called the Lifers Group because many of them have 20 years and better. Mm hmm and I use my lived experience as a teaching tool. We also have a, a curriculum, but it's loosely based around lived experience. Mm -hmm. And um, we talk about the core self. We talk about wounded boy. Yeah. So this wounded boy that was inside, right? Yeah, I struggled in a lot of that violence, whether it be, you know, violence was me, you know, it being in this role, right? Or this, in, in trying to adapt to a lifestyle. But I believe that our natural core self is good, right? Mm -hmm. So there's that war. We talk about living these two lifestyles. Many of us are forced into or get into these lifestyles because of environmental factors that proceed, that produce individuals that are really just trying to survive, mm -hmm. right? We're really just trying to survive in an environment, right? So... Yeah, I talk about urban trauma. I talk about you good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we we good. we, we, it, we in here now. We in the building right now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but that that's the thing that there are many of us that were just really trying to survive, and myself. So I had to navigate the prison system, being traumatized, and a lot of times we don't talk enough about trauma. We don't talk enough about aces, right? Mm -hmm. And I know you know we don't talk about the adverse childhood experiences, right? So growing up without that dad. And, you know, I was powerless. Can we talk about powerlessness, yeah. right? I was powerless. I was not able to stop my dad from leaving, mm -hmm. right? I couldn't stop him from leaving. So I found power in that. I found power at first being a class clown, mm -hmm. right? So mm -hmm. in that, taking that power away from the teacher and focusing on me, that was power. Then I found power in violence. Well, then we found power in drugs. And the real power was crack me me like oh my god this is what we've been looking for because it gave me something right so all this time i was looking for power and i think that the true power that i found that i was able to really latch on to despite like recovery is a lifestyle right mm -hmm. but power of education education gave me something that cracked it in Right, crack kept setting me back. I kept starting over. Education gave me something that, oh shoot, I get to keep this, mm -hmm. and you know, I could say something as a person, and you know, everybody has their journey, but I could say something as a person in recovery, and that'll be nice. But if I say it with a couple of letters behind my name, all of a sudden, people are listening. I don't know why, and they pay me a little bit more, right? But okay, <laughs> but. Growing up in this environment where you're you're hustling, right? We're all hustling. I learned that this hustle of information is 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 like better than crack, right? Nobody's running up on me saying, "Give me that PowerPoint, yo! Give me that PowerPoint! I want that speech." No one says that to me now, and I make you know money off of what's in my head and what's in my heart. So taking that street mentality, I tell people that you know I'm always going to be a street dude. That's where I come from. But the product that I sell now is information. I'm you so know. amazed you said that because as I've evolved, and you found it way quicker than I did, is I've always been off the cuff and I've used PowerPoints yeah. in different ways, but more to tell stories. Yeah. But now, even on Zoom meetings yeah. or like uh, when they ask me to speak somewhere or do a presentation, they say, um, do you... Do you do you have a PowerPoint? And I say, do I have to have one? And they go, what do you mean? I say, I just would like to answer questions. Yeah. I can give a little background yeah. and spur some thought, but then I would like to just live from my heart and my head, like yeah. you said, with the information I've learned of 22 years of being at CCAR right. and all those experiences in my own personal recovery, and I just want to share that. Right, right. And I think that's more 
even more of a connection. I know people want, some people learn different ways. Well, I want to, like you said, we're all here now. Like, yeah. you know, we're here. Yeah. That's the engagement. That's what recovery has taught me. Yep. Until you get a bunch of those data geeks in your room and they uh, want data. They yeah. want research. They want, oh, that's great, Daryl, but where's the research? Where's the data? So I always got to throw those in there. And when I do PowerPoints, yeah. I usually do pictures. I yeah. do slides. Yeah. I don't. I don't fill them with um, uh, all the data, words and yeah. stuff. I, yeah. I put pictures and we speak to that. And everybody's style is different, right. you know. But our, our lived experience, no one can. You can't mimic that, and you can't argue with it, right? So, and so, and and when people start asking me for data, I said, "What data it, right. do you need? Right. And can you tell me how that would reinforce the argument, or how that would right. help you?" It, it's it's interesting you say <laughs> that because. You know, you're an organization, so everybody wants evidence-based practice, right? I'm your best evidence-based practice there is. We're, I, I got the evidence. I'm telling you it's based in, in practice. I like when they me. say practice-based evidence, yeah, you like, know, that we've been doing this, and here's our evidence. Right. I, I yeah. can tell you if you do, you make certain, certain changes in your life, you'll never end up back in prison. I got that blueprint. I can tell you how it works. No question. I can tell you, you do not have to sell drugs to make to make a living. Even though where I grew up and my early professors in the street said that was the only way to success. That was a lie. That was a lie. And that was they, we were told that the only way we could be successful is either make a hit album or be be a, be a basketball player. All right. Uh, sports That's not star. true. That's not true. No, that's not, not true, true at all. You can all. do anything that you want. Mm -hmm. You know, I you know, and and, and learning value. And, and, you know, even our parents, I think that, you know, we always say that they, you know, they had, they gave us what they had, right? Okay, I get that. But also, like, our, I, I learned so much more. A lot of the information that my parents had wasn't right and exact either. Well, that just makes me think I learned a lot from what my parents couldn't right. give me. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I'll, I'll I, you know, saying that, you know, there was a particular man in my life who taught me, I say he taught me how to be a man, but he taught me, like, not the way you think. All the things that he did, I did the exact opposite. <laughs> like, I was like, I'm going to own my own money. I want to own my own place. I want to do this. I want to do that. I don't want to be dependent upon anyone. Mm -hmm. And he was the exact different. Was like, and there was a culture that, especially when I was hustling that, you know, you put everything in your girl's name. You did this. And, like, the old school people would understand it. And that was the thing. So if you got arrested that you'd still have your stuff when you got home well that I mean, nobody was making that kind of money anyway <laughs> like mm -hmm. yeah. so here is this thing but when we start to look historically we start to look at the like the slave back in the slave days it was the mother that protected the young boy mm -hmm. it was that so that culture right and there's so much that's that's rooted in that that we start to look at like wow well you know which is why it made us look like we weren't really making any moves because we everything was pushed off like it's not me, I'm not doing any like no, no, I'm doing this. This I'm doing it. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it. This is me. I'm out here, you know, and, and we, we you know, I think that we've just been so fortunate to you know, I've been very fortunate to have a platform like that people still call and ask the Ask my opinion about things, right? Well, you created your own platform because you are the class clown, you are the leader, 100%. you are the hustler. All those skills you learned that were maybe self-serving, you're now doing good and doing well at the same right. time. And right. you've just been at the self-awareness to kind of to transform those skills into helping other individuals. Well, and, and, you know, I love that you say that because even in leadership roles, I've mentored many, you know, um, CEOs, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And, and given them advice and my opinion. Some CEOs they, need street smart. Right, and, 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 and it wasn't smart. based off of, like, yes, I have a master's in organizational uh, management and leadership, but the, the information I'm giving them <laughs> is from the street. Yeah. It's, it's clearly from the street. I'm like, listen, you need to diversify your funds. You need to, <laughs> you need to do these things. And, and Phil and I had this conversation many years ago, the, and I'll say this and correct me if I'm wrong, CCAR was blowing them out the water because they weren't dependent on Demas's dollar. No. Like, Phil was already, like, Ch -ch -ch, they were getting, like, mm -hmm. that's the street mentality. We're yeah. getting money everywhere. We're doing, no, what, T-shirts? We got T-shirts. We got this. We got donuts. We got, like, you know what I mean? So it was different than these other organizations mm -hmm. when their funding was getting cut 
I was like, yo, you gotta diversify. They were like, no, no, we're gonna. And then when their funding got cut, they could, they were like, and or their checks were held up, they couldn't understand. Well, how are we supposed to keep the lights on? Go somewhere else and get money. Yeah, having, I mean, having shadowed Phil and and yeah. Ccar for twenty plus <laughs> years, especially when I was in my corporate role, every night he pitch some wild crazy scheme I'm like that's never gonna work there's too much risk involved with that you got it and every time it would just multiply and yeah. succeed <laughs> so he thinks i joke when i say he's a mentor like when i left i wanted i wanted to start like you know my nonprofit, and it was soft landing and i was really trying to get that like you know model mm -hmm. Couldn't find the right board members and, you know, struggles that nonprofits have. And we're still struggling with that a little bit. And, you know, it takes a lot to run a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. But the mentality that Phil, like, had really made me say, like, you know what? There were a lot of people trying to play it safe. And it's really not, not like you're, like, you know, but mm -hmm. they were playing it too comfortable. And it's just like someone telling you it's your last day. I think that... Um, there's so much more to like in all the leadership books that I've read and in all the leaders I've studied, I know now how you've played it, how mm -hmm. I've seen it is exactly right. There's no, there's no like, and then there's really like everybody has their own sauce, right? What's your sauce? Mm -hmm. Yeah. But um, there's no like you know, Miriam Williamson says it the best, right? Mm -hmm. Playing it safe benefits no one. Mm -hmm. Right, so I'm not like you know I play it safer, right? I don't I don't risk my freedom because I know that that would benefit a lot of people would lose if I made a made a poor choice and mm -hmm. you know. Well, I think when you talk about playing it safe, it's it's more about managing risk. Right. Yeah. And yeah. and I wrote a couple pieces on fear based management and faith based leadership. So when you're fear based management. It's not that you're like assessing a risk mm -hmm. and when you assess a risk, you're looking at what's the worst case scenario right. and people can jump there easily like, right. you know, the end of the world comes. But then how likely is that to happen? Right. And so when you're assessing risk, people often go to the extreme of trying to eliminate risk, not only in their agency. That's why they create multiple like layers of policies right. and tell people exactly what to do. To go to your point, they'll hire a peer because it's a wonderful thing, but they'll fire a peer because of their right. fear. Right. And what, I just love what you said about that. So it's not about eliminating risk. It's about taking calculated risk. And I'm more risk, um, I'm more willing to take risks than most leaders, right. I would right. say. And that's what you're talking about. Absolutely. Is, and, and what's the worst case scenario if you, if, I mean, we've had some things that haven't gone well, right. and I've probably invested in a couple places where it didn't work out well, but those are far outweighed by all the successes. You so, know? so it's yeah. always a balance, but you try to have way more successes than things that don't work well. <laughs> I love that you see that, and, and let's look at this, and let's bring it back to the street. Yeah. When you're in poverty, right, and you've been to prison, in the worst case scenario, when you talk about risk, yeah. I sell these drugs and I make $5,000. Yeah. Or I end up in jail. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no other options, right? There's, options are few. <laughs> You're not hiring me. <laughs> my my kid still needs to eat, right? I always challenge social workers, right? Mm -hmm. Shout out to social workers. I, don't, <laughs> I always get bashed because I talk about social workers. But I say, um, what would you do to feed your child? Right now, we're not condoning criminal behavior, but at some times when we're talking about survival, we talk about poverty, we talk about all these different things. The risk is I'm going to take a shot for my family. Mm -hmm. That's what people do. So when we understand that, then we say, well, we need to eliminate crime. No, we need to lower poverty. Mm -hmm. We need to increase opportunities in urban environments yeah. in order for people to survive. That why that like that's not attractive. Like, oh, so that's oh, wait, the solution. Do that? I'm right. not going to do that when I can do this, yeah, right? Yeah. I can laugh at drug selling. I'm like, yeah, there's no way I'm going to make what I make right now in the street. That's way too much risk. When I can just turn my computer on and make four grand talking to All 20 right. people. All right. Right? Yeah. So I understand that. Everybody doesn't have that opportunity. So we 
when we talk to policymakers or we talk to people, how do we increase the opportunities to lower the risk taking? Yeah. You'll eliminate crime by just that, right? But there are systems, mm-hmm. can we be honest here? We can. There are systems that benefit mm-hmm. off of people making those of uncalculated risks mm-hmm. that, you know, that's how systems roll, right? Mm-hmm. So they're like, yeah, we need to keep people in poverty. And, you know, I was in D.C. a while ago in, a, in, a, in an unofficial he said, can I take my badge off and talk to you? I was mm-hmm. like, absolutely. Mm-hmm. He said, poverty is a trillion-dollar business. Mm-hmm. And I was like, what? And he's like, poverty is a trillion-dollar business. So people benefit off of poverty. Mm-hmm. So therefore, we're fighting to try to change things when there are systems that are trying fighting the same fight to keep things the same. Right. Right? I, when you talk about systems, I have Don Coyhis in my head, and he summed it up beautifully decades ago for me when he said your system is perfectly designed oh yeah for the results you're getting exactly and and people when you tell them that they go oh my god because it's so yeah. it's so simple but it's so mind blowing yeah. and so you look at the results you're getting a lot of systems want those results right. which is exactly what you're saying right right so <laughs> it, so when i went to the guy and i said hey I'm the only person not making a hundred thousand dollars a year. He said, "I know." Uh-huh. He knew that, and he wasn't trying to change that. He's like, "You're lucky you're making that, right?" So here's a system trying to keep me in a certain position where I should have been like, "Oh, thank you." So sir. why were was it? Do you think because of your color or oh, your absolutely. education? It was like, just it was a, just a, a, a no, race. I believe thing. that it was it was systemic racism is everywhere because in their said, structure, right? Yeah. As the people that I worked under were buying houses and cars, I was not moving. I was not progressing forward, mm-hmm. right? And even though the money that I was making was more than some other people that may look like me, based off of my education and experience, I should have been making a lot more. Right. Yet there was someone who was in control of that right there was someone that was denying that there was like a so gatekeeper to that, that it was that, that blatant yeah and it was that, yeah. i mean that where they just oh, told no. you he's like no i know like he said <laughs> I, I, I know <laughs> he said i know and i looked at him like all right so i'm waiting for him to say don't worry now we're gonna he was like i know and so but then i have to look at it like this right wow. Growing up, I've been black all my life, right? Really? So growing, yeah, yeah. You never told me that. As far as I can remember, (laughs) right? So understanding that there's sometimes that there's going to be doors closed based off of people's beliefs, right? We talk about the iceberg, right? If Mm -hmm. you think about an iceberg, the iceberg, you see the top of the iceberg. You see it, right? But if you don't know what's below the waterline, Mm -hmm. Mm mm-hmm. You're only judging me off the top of the iceberg. There's so much more below the waterline. Right. You know, I was in leadership in big company, right? And I was on the, uh, you know, throughout my career, I was in charge of the affirmative action yeah, plan at yeah, one point. Yeah. I was on the diversity council, then the inclusion yeah. council. Like, you know, I go to UConn and I'm like, yeah, I've been there, done that. I get the whole thing, right? Yeah. Now I'm in a world of social justice being my taught faith. in higher ed, right? Yeah very activist and had to really challenge a lot of my beliefs about all of that. And I will tell you, tell the world that I had a bias because of some experiences I had where I saw um, people of color getting a role hired because of the color of their skin and not their competency. And I was basing their competency on the fact that they never spoke up or contributed at the table, in quotation marks, right, at the table. So I was like, you know, it's performative. We hired a person of color, they're sitting at the table, they got a seat at the table, we're represented, but he hasn't done anything for me lately. And it was when I got to UConn and had a one-on-one conversation with a woman of color and started to hear her story that I understood as he got the seat at the table and he was scared to death of losing it. So being neutral Mm -hmm. and not contributing was better than contributing and losing it. That's what Daryl said. And it just pivoted my whole thinking. Mm -hmm. I still think there are people hired just based on the color of their skin, but if they're not there, even if they're not good, we're not learning. 
Yeah, but there's a struggle with that because mm-hmm. having been under leadership of people of color mm-hmm. and seeing them play that role mm-hmm. is very difficult, especially when you're a leader, you're a lion, mm-hmm. and you need to be fed. You mm-hmm. need to be fed in this jungle, right? You need mm-hmm. to be. Yeah. You need another lion to mm-hmm. say, show safe. you. Walk right? alongside. But, Let's do this. Yeah, like you see this, what you think to be a lion, and and this is, this is this is a challenge because when you come in with a lion's mentality, and you see, for a lack of a better term, a hyena in a leadership position, and you're trying to figure out why we're not charging. Because the hyenas are just laughing because mm-hmm. the hyena likes the money and the hyena likes the position. So uh, the lion uh, is stuck. Uh, and the mm-hmm. lion at the time will at, at some point outshine. This is why a lot of we don't get a lot of offers as lions, right? Because no one wants another lion in there in there there unless you're a progressive leader, mm-hmm. will you take the opportunity to say this person is gonna be something? So we got to build the pride. Well, yeah. And, what, and what you're talking to is, I've always said the number one goal of leaders is to develop other leaders. That's from John Maxwell. The I best that, leader, yeah. That it's to develop other leaders. So you're always there to support other leaders. Right. And I've seen you doing that as well. That you want to develop other leaders. 100%. I can't be the only one mm-hmm. because there's a problem. This is why we don't use the term um, resilient. We got to watch it. We got to watch resilience. We can't keep using the term resilience because the systems that be, let's see, let's call it systemic racism, if you will, those people that that inspire or subscribe to that will say, well, if Daryl made it, why can't you? Mm-hmm. No, whoa, whoa. I made it because I'm playing this game and I'm moving to pieces. And, and do you think you've made it? No, absolutely. I think that I'm, right. I'm, I'm on this journey. I'm on a right. journey, and, I, and God has put me in a really great place. Look where I am today. I'm sitting mm-hmm. with you, mm-hmm. right? Um, so I've been I've been allotted a lot of great opportunities. There's so much more that I want to do, and I, but at the end of the day, like you know, what I ask my prayer is today, God, no matter where I go, man, no matter where I go, just allow me to be humble. Right. If I make a hundred million dollars, I want to be humble. I want to be yes. Do I want a hundred million? Absolutely. But I want to be mm-hmm. a person that's hum- that has that that's humble, that's willing to give every chance to another person. Right. That's what I want. Like yeah, I want the successes, but I also want to bring so many more. Like I believe we're on a modern day underground railroad. Right. So I believe. And that made my um, Instagram is Harry Tubman 18, right? Mm-hmm. Because I believe we're on a modern day underground railroad. So I am holding the door open. I am bringing others with me. I am not doing it alone. And I'm going back and trying to bring as many people with me through this door so that people don't think that it's unique, that we're unicorns. No, there are many people mm-hmm. like me that are better than me. That are There's someone sitting in a cell right now that's going to, if they just take the opportunity to shoot just for the stars, they're going to be better than whatever I, ever I've accomplished. But hopefully I set the foundation. I let the springboard. I brought the trampoline in for you to go in and bounce higher than me. Mm-hmm. Right? I'll hold it, but jump. Right? So many times that you know you know the story about the fleas in the jar, right? Are you familiar with the fleas in the jar? I don't know about, I don't the know fleas. about this one. All right. So, right, let's talk about the fleas in the jar. So you put a bunch of fleas in the jar, and they're jumping, and they're hitting the top of the jar, hitting the top of the jar. Then you take the top off the jar, the fleas stop jumping. They don't jump. They don't even try to get out the jar because they are believe that the top is still there. So no one ever jumps out of the jar. We all believe that we're in this jar. So we need at least one flea to jump. Oh, shoot, what? You we can, can go. We can go. But because the system has the top on the jar, there's so many fleas just sitting there waiting for their 5, 10, 20 years to be up. Oh, my gosh, Daryl. Yeah. Um, yeah. Just like. You know, yeah. You know, you know, uh, you know I'm a big fan of yours. How oh. can Now you, me too. How, how do you me think too. that no. um, me or Seacar can help you? Um, yeah, I think that, you know, I – I love CCAR, you know, and not because we're here, just because of what you do. And there's so many people that I have grown up with, either been incarcerated with, the marches, the things. I think that you need to continue to promote recovery. Mm-hmm. But I think that, you know, at, at there needs to be a shift 
where we, I think personally, and I'll say this to you, and then you know, I, I'll have my lawyer call you when, when, when I see you, <laughs> right? Um, but I think that there needs to be a, rec- a culturally competent recovery coaching class. I think that you know, and me and my me and my brothers have been working on some brothers across the country have been working on that, and I'm saying it to you because I know that you have the ability to to make something like that happen and stand with substance that recovery for black and brown people is different than for white people, right? Mm -hmm. So I am a person in recovery and they teach me how to be in recovery and now I'm not using drugs, but I get to see the world in a lens that is still screwed up, right? So I get my recovery, but I still go back to an impoverished neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Um, There's so much pushing and you know, we've talked offline about MAT. They're promoting MAT inside prisons, and they're giving it to people who've been in prison 10, 20 years. But just in case you might use heroin, we're going to promote, we're going to give you this. Okay, tell me how I'm supposed to live. Tell me how am I supposed to speak to employers about being on MAT. We're not preparing people enough, like especially in our inner cities, that it's one thing to be in recovery, but how do we teach people how to live in that impoverished environment in recovery? Right, so yeah, I'm I'm clean, for lack of a better term. Those that don't like it, I apologize, but the fact that I am not using substances is only the top of the iceberg. Mm-hmm. The bottom of the iceberg is I still need to feed my kids. Mm-hmm. I still need to do this. I got a criminal record. I got this going on. I got that going on. So in our recovery of going back to these disenfranchised communities. How do we teach that? Like when I was in your recovery coaching class, you taught me everything about how to move, how to do these things, how to, you know, use my story as a tool. Like I'm always indebted to Seacar because they taught me how to do that. But now I need more. The lion needs to be fed. I need to learn how to not only use my story, but navigate disenfranchised communities and also bring other people up. How do we encourage other people? Because every every story is not a meeting. We don't we're not talking like how my name is Daryl and I'm an alcoholic or I'm an I'm an addict. Mm-hmm. I'm telling you, my name is Daryl. I've been through some things, and through my journey, this is what I saw, and this is what I think. If you implement this, this will happen. Stop creating these spaces. There's like what a billion dollars about to come to every community in this country based off the lawsuit. Yet they have. They have attorney generals who are sitting with this money saying, we don't know what to do, right? So encourage us, those of us with lived experience, especially in impoverished neighborhoods where the war on drugs have dismantled these communities that have still yet to been given back. We we blow up countries and then we rebuild them. Mm -hmm. We got Albany Avenue that's still Mm -hmm. destroyed by a crack epidemic. So when do we come together and rebuild those communities and show people how to, like, like, like I tell my kids, right? We live in this house and they don't like, they'll make, miss the garbage can. <laughs> like, this is your, this is yours. Like, how do we encourage people to appreciate what they have? And, you know, I know that was a lot, but. It is a lot. So you got my mind spinning. Yeah, let's, let's, I, let's go. I, I let's love go. the challenge. Let's I do. Let, I let's, love the challenge. It's not just about promoting black people. No, and, I get and giving it. Them, right? We need well, to, I, I heard they more need you a talk table. about like. <laughs> they a, need a table, right? A recovery coach class w- for culturally competent. Just let me, I'm doing a little coaching here myself, paraphrasing yeah. what yeah, I heard, yeah, yeah. feeding it back. I'll have some water. <laughs> yeah, but, but it's, it would be the idea of if I'm a recovery coach. I, I would like some information on how to work with people in poverty or impoverished neighborhoods that are going back there on how to help rebuild their first their own lives mm-hmm. and how do they do that in that type of environment right. and have some skills and suggestions and, right. of course, what the person wants to do being first and foremost. But also you're talking about rebuilding communities, which is... Uh, an amazing kind of daunting task, but it's like, how do we, right. how do we infuse recovery into these communities? If that's the lifestyle, right. and there's other ways to make money that are not recovery hostile, right. Right. you know, right. that, right. that right. they're right. they're right. recovery friendly, exactly. that would promote recovery and health and well-being. Exactly, and and that is, 
that's the piece of it. Like even understanding, we were just talking earlier about police interaction. Mm -hmm. How do we, like we talk about like a lot of times, there's so much money around de-escalation. Yeah. Right? But the people that are doing de-escalation training are usually white trainers or what Mm -hmm. have you. When I interact with police, I'm always in de-escalation mode. My my tone, my yeah. hands. So ask me what de-escalation looks like, because I right. can tell you. Because anytime I interact with law enforcement, I have to do it to survive. I have to do it to survive. <laughs> so why are you reaching out to someone who has no clue, right? And a uh-huh. lot of times, even like from the peer movement, you don't utilize your peers who have the information. Mm-hmm. And like you said, and we were talking about who may just sit silently because they're just happy to be making the money. Mm -hmm. And and the money, and, you know, by the grace of God, you know, we've been in a situation where I can say a little bit more than someone who's just trying to hold on to their job. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you were, and you said it. You said, I could have said nothing at DMS and probably still be there. 20 years. Easy, easy. Do your bid. Just (laughs) do my bid. Do my bid. But God wouldn't allow that. God God said clearly, I did not put you here to do that, oh, and that oh, would have been oh. that would have been a disservice to to so many others, right? And and many people, my own culture, let's be honest, judged me almost like criminalized me for leaving that role, and you know, and that's that's a struggle. Too. So when we start to talk about working with communities, we need to understand that there's a certain like you know, there's a lot that comes with that when you when oh, you step gosh. out. When you step out and you try to step up, people are going to judge you. So we need to prepare our leaders to be able to, like, water off a duck's back, bro. What do you, what means more? Well, You're 100 likes on Instagram or saving a life today. Like, you know, I got a, I, people mm-hmm. call me and say, I got a guy that just did 18 uh-huh. years. I'd rather work with the guy that did 18 sure. years who needs me to get him some socks versus what right. somebody in a political position or somebody says about so, me. Well, I think we are starting to wrap up here. So, but ah, we um, can go forever. I know, but <laughs> in the, in the, in our culture, and in, and this, I really learned this in England. They have a thing called the tall poppy syndrome, mm. and the tall poppy syndrome is um, they had like I can't remember six or seven counties, and they all got funding to do recovery services. One county took this funding and did amazingly well. Mm. And most people would think that you would take that learning and apply it to the other county, counties. They cut the funding to the county that was doing well because they uh, were making the other counties look bad. Right. So that's the tall poppy. So instead of like trying to ra- grow your other poppies in the poppy field to right. the same height as the tall poppy, you cut the tall poppy down. Yeah. How often do we do that in sports figures or political figures or yeah. celebrities or anybody? And you just talked about it a little bit. You, In your community, you might have achieved a little celebrity status, and then they couldn't wait to chop you down. They're, you know? they're waiting. And, they're waiting. And we did it with, like, Tiger Woods. We tried to do it with Michael Jordan. We tried to do it with all these athletes. There's a, you know, there's just, a bunch that you would think about. Just tear them down. Yeah, yeah. There, there's some people that, you know, because they took a different stance. Yeah. You know, um, you know, there's a lot of people who who judge Bill Cosby, and you know, yeah. um, for a long time, Bill Cosby was quote unquote America's dad. Yeah. And people missed the fact that right when he started to have his problems, he started to tell black men to take care of their families. Yeah. And he started to change his messaging, and he started to direct it to a certain culture. And, and I don't know, whatever, believe in coincidences or what, but all of a sudden he no longer became that because he's a very, at the time, he was in a very high position, which a lot of times, you know, black people, and you think of the Fred Hamptons and you think of all the people that who have come before us who took that step out and tried to guide people, whether it be in Fred Hampton, not black, not just black, poor whites too, those people that stood out and tried to guide people ended up finding a demise, whether it be death or, you know, disenfranchisement, if you will. Mm-hmm. So it's very scary place to be, right, to try to do that, which is why when we start to talk about building structures and building communities, we need our white counterparts to be in line with us because there's certain places I can't go that you can walk in and be Phil all day, get us the money or get us the building, and then we come back, and they be like, well, "Like, yeah, that's what we do." Because 
It's chestnut checkers. So, I don't learn well from <laughs> from anger yeah. and, and protest. So when I think about, like, I talked about social activism yeah. at UConn and the Black Lives Matter movement and all of that, the protests, the I don't learn well that way. You don't even see them anymore. Right. Nothing changed. This is how I great. learn. <laughs> yeah. But I also feel way too much, and I've had a feeling week, mm-hmm. so which is probably yeah. why I never did this work because I feel too much. But um, I've learned so much from you today. Oh, thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Thank you so much. No, this was this was cool, and I was excited when when you know Phil's name came up on my phone and he mm-hmm. said, "Hey, let's do something." And you know, I'm always like I'm inspired. I'm truly inspired by, you know, the work that he's done, the work we've been now. You know, I remember the one time I felt. I wasn't a Phil fan, right? Right. I had those days. Right. Is is we were here. I was walking or something. I think we were here. I was going to a meeting. He was going to a meeting or something. And I really thought so there's two times in my life that I thought I'd be I was I was C car I was C car material, right? When I first got out of prison, I went to and I told Phil this, I went to um like my I wrote a five year plan. And First stop was Secar Recovery Community Center in New London, mm-hmm. which was really in Waterford. But when I got there, it wasn't there, and I was like, "That was my plan. That was oh, that was my plan. Yeah, it was yeah. there, yeah. and it wasn't there." And I was disappointed, and I was like, "Man!" But I did find my way to Secar, and I remember when I was going through my my situation with Demas and Yale and all this stuff, and I was really confused. I had a, maybe two, two conversations with Phil. And one, I was like, well, I'm going to just end up at Seacar anyway, and we're going to blow past these people. But if that wasn't God's plan. But I remember Phil saying something to me, and um, he said to me, um, the comeback story is always, is always I'm, he said, I can't wait to hear your comeback story. And when he said it to me, I was in a, a, a place that I was like, man, I want to work with you. Like, I want to do, I want to work with you. And he just said that. And I just, and I didn't know what it meant. It just was like, but today I'm so grateful because now I know the comeback story is, is, is exactly what, one another one of his, his things, right? Um, well, I want you to know too that um, um, CCAR, and as long as I'm here, I mean this with all my heart, I've got your back. No, I, so if yeah. you need anything or you're I down or that. whatever, please, please see me. And we are posting for a lot of positions <laughs> lately. Yeah, <laughs> we yeah. Not, we we can, probably can't afford you anymore, but we are posting no, for no. a lot of positions. God is good right now, but <laughs> tomorrow we never know. I'll drive the van. Uh, I'll, yeah. drive, I'll drive a van. If you ever but, want a steady yeah, income no, and a yeah. steady place, no, no, and you don't have to hustle, you know, yeah. you know where it's coming from, no, yeah. I encourage you to apply. Seagard. It's not a guarantee, yeah. but I encourage you to apply. I, I appreciate that. Seagard is always, mm-hmm. it was, it was, a, it was, a, you know, when someone says, and people probably like I had this happen to me, right? And I know we're probably going over time. But someone mm-hmm. said to me, I said to I, I said to a friend who was struggling, I was like, you're gonna get on the other side of this, and when you do, you're gonna you're gonna really appreciate, I, you know, because we've learned that we can't throw the pillow under someone's head when they're falling. They need to go through that. Like mm-hmm. we cannot deny individuals the experience of going through something because they, they don't learn mm-hmm. right so i was like oh man you know what yeah i could definitely give you 200 bucks and you could yeah but if when you get to the other side you're going to appreciate the journey and they mm-hmm. were so pissed at me so i was the same way um, like right? well the, like, the church lady version is let your trial become your testimony mm-hmm. yeah. yeah like mm-hmm. That yeah. is not what you ever say no, when somebody's no, in a the, trial. Yeah. No, no, no. I, you know, I like Brene, is it Brene, Brene Brown? Brown? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm where she's fan. like, yeah, hey, yeah, that's too bad. But, but least, mm-hmm. least you had a, a, a job. Right. <laughs> what? Like, right. you know, so um, I love I love her, and I love when she says that, you know, nothing, no help has ever started where, with but least or whatever. Mm-hmm. So I think that, you know, there's so many life lessons that I learned, and there's, you know, and true love for Phil, true love for Phil, right? Um, and an utmost respect because of what you've accomplished. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we talk about this. He was in a meeting one day, and I was 
I was a grunt working for that organization. We won't keep giving them play, right? <laughs> but his moves were so, like, what I want. Like, there's certain people I watch. I even watch Zuckerberg. He comes in with no suit on. He's just like, mm-hmm. you know, I'm like, man, I like that, you know? Mm-hmm. And when Phil was there, like, everybody was like, oh, and he was just sitting there drawing. Mm-hmm. And that's a comfortable place to be in life. And that's what I want from leadership. I want to be that comfortable leader. I was I was just telling my team the other day, I want us to be in a position where we're comfortable. Like, we don't have to, we're not, you know, on edge because we're worried. We are in a comfortable position because we put ourselves in a comfortable position. You know, um, something that Phil said that, that really stood out is that when I was going through that process, everybody was like, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? The only thing I could do was stay relevant. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So every time I got a gig, every time I trans, every time I traveled, if I ate something that was good, I posted it, and people started like really seeing it. And sometimes I was in four different cities in two weeks. They were like, "He must be doing." I, I want to. What, what's he doing? And that kept me relevant mm-hmm. until people really started to take notice. And then when they bring you in, they realize you have substance too. I'm not just. Mm-hmm. A pretty vase, right? That right. smells good. Right, right. Uh, appreciate you. Um, thank you, Daryl. Thanks, Daryl. Oh, we gotta thank wrap you. it up, but oh, this man. was so. Part so, two anytime. Let's yeah, go. Let's you got get it. it. <laughs> so so good. Uh,